Welcome to Soul Night Live, episode number 103. Today, our guest is Chasm Sultan. Hey, Kaz. Hi. How Good are you? Good afternoon. It's, thanks for dropping by. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, I've been well, hoping to have you on for a while now. And now that you got this new album, it seems like the perfect chance. It works out. The, oh, it always works out the way it's supposed to, doesn't it? I'd like to think so. Yeah, absolutely. So now that the album is, is it out now or is it going to be out in like a few days? Uh, the single is out. The single came out last week. More love. Uh, yes, correct. And um, and then uh, uh, the album drops on September 17th with uh, a live stream on um, September 9th. That's kind of like a press conference slash um, uh, performance slash Q and A with um, with the band, my band, and uh, and and a few other people. Awesome. Okay. And where's the best place to get this record? Uh, best place would be Amazon or um, uh, iTunes. Uh, and if you're looking for a bundle, which is like a T-shirt, the tote bag, and all 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 that neat stuff. Uh, you can go to Deco uh, and Entertainment. I believe it's DecoEntertainment.com. And uh, that's the, my record label, uh, Deco Records. So it's D-E-K-O Entertainment. Um, and then you should be able to uh, find the record and the bundles and the, if you want an actual physical CD. Okay, that sounds great. Well, folks, make a note of that and pick up a copy. Pick up a few copies. Get the that bundle would be too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that'd be great. So, um, so it's Chasm twenty twenty one. Yes. Now, is, is this any way connected to your first solo album, which was also self titled? Well, the, the the first album was was self titled. It, it was Chasm. It didn't have a year attached to it. Um, this one, uh, because it's, you know, I, I I played around with a couple of different ideas for titles of the record and. Uh, there's always, you know, there's always some caveat involved in that of of trying to, you know, come up with a good story as to why I called it uh, any particular name. Um, and I just thought that that just for brevity purposes and just to keep it really as simple as possible, that um, yeah, I would just call it the year that it was being released, 2021. Sure. Okay. And, it, and you know, it makes it makes a little bit more sense because. It's my most recent work. It's what I'm doing right now. It's what I'm most proud of. And uh, and this is, you know, this is where we are in the world. Right. So was this something that happened once COVID started? You thought, well, I've got this time on my hands. I might as well do a record. Or was it already kind of in the oven cooking? It was already, uh, we had already started. I started the record in 2019 with uh, Phil Thornalley, um, who was my writing partner and, uh, just a, a, one of my best friends on the planet. And uh, we, uh, I, I think it was the, probably the summer of, uh, of 2019. Um, uh, I, I was over in, uh, in England and uh, I went by Phil's house as I want to do often when I'm the, whenever I'm there. Uh, and he said, yeah, any plans to, uh, to do a new record? Uh, a new Kasim Sultan record. And I was like, you know, well, I'm always thinking about it. He said, well, let's do one. So I had a couple of uh, half three quarter finished songs at that point, which, uh, you know, I'm always, I'm constantly writing. And uh, I played some stuff for Phil. We finished a few things. And so that was how the album started. Uh, it started with a, with a few songs and then uh, came back to uh, England later that year. Uh, and at the beginning of, uh, of 2020, just before the pandemic uh, hit, I was, I was in London again. Um, and then it was just a, one of those things where it, most often, more often than not these days, it was like file transfers and Phil, me completing one thing and Phil sending it back to me and back and forth and back and forth. I was going to ask about that, kind of what was the creative process like? Did Would you write most of these on guitar and then kind of send it to him and see what he does with it or how? Um, most, most of the, uh, you know, I go through phases of uh, guitar writing uh, for six months or a year, 
uh, and then I'll put the guitar down and I'll I'll write a bunch of uh, songs on piano. This record uh, was was piano based. Um, and uh, I wrote most of the songs or most of the songs were started on on piano, whether they got finished that way. Uh, it, I would have you'd have to ask me about the individual songs. But um, yeah, I, uh, I, I I was in I was in a piano phase at that time. So okay. well, most of the stuff on piano. OK, well, I kind of figured it would probably be guitar or piano. Do you ever do, start on bass or is that not as Rare, uh, rarely? But I have I, I have. And usually what happens with with bass guitar is if I'm if I come up with a little riff or something like that, that I say, oh, that's pretty cool. Maybe I should uh, explore that a little bit. Um, that would normally uh, be a, a like a riff based tune, something sure. like that. Yeah. Now, as a you know, as a team, how would you say you collaborate on these? Like, do you kind of like, do you get the go, you do the initial idea and then send it to him to have him kind of, you know, mold into something else or vice versa? Well, most of these songs uh, started, the, the, they started their, their infancy um, as, as Phil and I in the same room. Oh, great. Um, yeah working together and i would uh i would come uh come in with an idea and, and and you know out of maybe 10 ideas we'd kind of whittle that down to two or three that phil thought were um were were interesting enough to explore uh maybe finishing um so what we would do normally is we we'd start with with an idea and so you know there are a couple of, of tracks on this record that that phil started too um but in any case so i would come in and then i would have a melody and i would just sing some gibberish over the melody not not necessarily having any any kind of lyric idea um and, and then um we would uh we we would explore that and uh nine times out of ten if, if if i didn't have a specific idea about what the uh what the song was was a was going to be about um phil would uh would throw out some lyric ideas and i would throw out some lyric ideas and and then it would just it's that that's what co-writing is all about you know sure. yeah so that's it's, how that happened. Yeah, it's always nice to have someone to bounce ideas off of. You know? It's, it's very like, important because if if I was left to my own devices, I, I would still be working on the record. Exactly. I think we all fall prey to that. You know, yeah. it's like you start second guessing yourself. And then, yeah, well, I you know, I don't know who said it. And I said it on my last record, too. But it's 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 so it's so true. It's like for an artist or at least for me, it's a you never really you never really finish a record. You abandon it. This is true. You know. Very because true. at a certain point you have to say, okay, I, that's it, I'm done. Um, but I, the, but there's always that. Let me just try to you know fix this here, or change this here, or make this a little better, or bring this out a little bit more. So uh, yeah, you, you kind of abandon it, feeling like you could have done more. When you right. listen back to a record like that a year later, do you still go, oh, I wish I would have done this? Or does those things just yeah. kind of fade away? No, I mean, it, it, it depends on how busy I am. If I'm, if I'm not busy, uh, then I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I will be, um, I might get stuck in that thing. You know what? I should go remix that song and I should put this extra part in that I always thought it needed. Um, but if I'm busy doing, uh, doing other stuff, then uh then i don't you know that that's not a um it's not a concern how often do you find yourself listening to your old records and not very just, often not i don't think not, many not often do, it, not honestly. often at all the only time that i go back and 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 do a deep dive into my old material is if i'm ready to start working on a a, a live show and, and i'm trying to find tunes that uh that i want the band to play so then i will go back to my earlier solo work and uh and and listen to stuff and and think well i haven't done that song yet or i have haven't done that song in a while might be cool to bring that one out i have to then i have to relearn it so right. um, so listening to old material becomes a, a, an important part of uh of, of putting a, a show together for you know for live performances sure how much of it like for instance i'm sure you have songs that you played a lot 
20 years ago or more and then didn't for a couple decades. Mm -hmm. How much of that is still in there when you go back to learn those songs and how quickly does it come back to you? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I you know, um, I, I, I tend not to retain stuff that long. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I rather move on. If I have played the song recently or played it um, consistently over the course of say, 10, 15 years, then it's not a problem. I know it. Um, I'm familiar with it. But if it's a song that I've not played in 10 or 15 years or or haven't done extensively in previous tours, um, then it's like then I, I can't for the life of me figure out how I did it. You know? So you're almost kind of learning it from scratch. Correct. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Well, yeah. That includes some of the utopia stuff that you and Todd did on the last tour, you know, like communion of the sun and some of those that you guys hadn't touched. Yeah. Anymore. Well, the good thing about that stuff is that um, for the most part, for the most part, there weren't a whole lot of overdubs uh, on those records. There weren't a whole lot of uh, 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 extra stuff a little bits here and there, you know, uh, but uh, but but a lot of it was uh, was a four piece four piece band. We certainly, you know, stacked background vocals and stuff like that and, and made sure that uh, that the uh, that the, the the that element of a record was uh, w was filled out. Um, but uh, the, the Utopia stuff. I mean, like re just recently, I did uh, I did a Cassim Sultan's Utopia tour. I saw that. At, well, I didn't see it. I don't think you've made it to Atlanta yet, but I hope you do. No, no, I, 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 we, we're, we're planning on it. Um, oh, excellent. So, excellent. so one of the songs that I did in that show was a song called um, I think it was from um, "Deface the Music," which was like the third or fourth album that that the, that I did with the band. Um, it's a song called Hoi Polloi, and it's it's got a ton of um, overdubs on it, uh, and um, and that was an interesting one to have to learn because we never played it live. But most of the stuff that that I did in that Utopia show, we had at one time or another played live, like um, Fix Your Gaze, Monument, If I Just Want to Touch You, um, uh, Set Me Free. Uh, it was a, a a few others that we did. Uh, a, pretty much every single tour. Um, so there wasn't, I didn't have to go back and relearn some of that stuff, but there was the odd tune that, uh, that we had never done before because part of, of my whole thing with the Cassim Sultan's Utopia was I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to tip, uh, tip my hat and, and treat the fans to songs that ne weren't necessarily played uh, uh, on every single tour that we did, and sometimes not never performed live, like Hoi yeah. Polloi, you know, that was never. Yeah, I thought so. Well, I just thought that was such a great idea when you did it because you know you have sung and written so many great Utopia songs, and and it's just cool to see a show that's heavily weighted in that, mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, I wanted to do like, you know, I, I really wanted to do a uh, deep tracks tour for because I think, you know, uh, as much as people like hearing One World and, and Set Me Free and uh, uh, Libertine or, you know, any, oh, Back on the Street or something like that, I think it's uh, I, I just think it's, a, it, 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 you know, it's respectful to do stuff that uh, that 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 they wouldn't normally have heard. Uh, was eternal love in there? You know, uh, everybody always asks me about that particular track, and uh, it, it, it's such a um, it, it's such a specialized song, and it wasn't. It, we we I, we maybe we did it on one tour at the very very beginning, right after the record came out, but we never really did it again, and. Uh, uh, it, it's just not it, it, that song does not lend itself to a live setting. That's a okay. that that's really a really real record song. Yeah, very stu much a very much a studio. Yeah, creation. yeah, it's got that whole big middle section that's you know that that's kind of uh, kind of dreamy and you know it's uh, it, it doesn't lend itself to a, to a live show. 
Sure. That's understandable. And some songs are just like that, you know, yeah. I mean, just look at half of the Beatles catalog, you know, especially the later half, you know, it's like, yeah. even if they'd done them live, they probably would have had a lot of trouble trying to admit yeah. it. Well, everybody like, does those songs live now. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, it yeah. could totally be done nowadays, yeah. but in, you know, the late sixties, no, mm -hmm. not really. Um, so I have a few fan questions I wanted to sprinkle in here also. Um, uh, question, I have a reader that was curious, your favorite Utopia albums. My, my, my Well, that's a good thing you said, albums. Um, yeah. My favorite Utopia album, I think, would be uh, Oblivion. Because it's got some, uh, it's got a couple of tracks on there that, uh, that in, in my pantheon of, uh, of material that I always like to, uh, to perform live and to and to remember the band by uh, there are two songs that um that are my probably my all-time favorite utopia songs and that is i will wait and maybe i could change oh, yeah. there's a bunch of other really really good songs on that record um but those two songs are probably my favorite utopia songs i do maybe i could change i do it all the time in my solo shows um and uh, when we did uh, uh, the when we revisited Utopia a couple of years ago with myself, Todd, uh, Willie and Gil Assayas on keyboards, um, I, I, I asked I, to, to I said, can we please do I Will Wait because that's one, that was probably my favorite all time Utopia song. Well, that was an awesome tour, and um, and Gil was quite a find, I got to say, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, that was a last minute thing, you know, we. Uh, we scrambled at the uh, at the ninth hour. Uh, Ralph, uh, God bless him. You know, yeah, rest um, in peace, Ralph. May he rest him. in peace. Yeah, he was just such a wonderful, wonderful guy, a brilliant musician, um, and just a sweetheart. Uh, um, and about two weeks before we were ready to start the tour um ralph uh, unfortunately said you know i don't think it's a really good idea if i do this i think that uh um i i, I think i need to beg off uh and you need to find somebody else because i don't want to go through halfway through the tour and then be so you know it's so ill that i can't um i can't finish so you know I, i'm i'm really sorry but you, you should find someone else um, Todd, to his credit, you know, wanted uh, he didn't want to bring in somebody um, before because we knew Ralph wasn't 100 percent, but we thought that he'd be able to do the tour. So um, so it, we we were like we didn't know what to do. We, it was like it, it was scary. Sure. Um, and, and we were soliciting um, uh, demo tapes <clears throat> from not only fans, but from, you know, I mean, I opened my my phone and I tried to, you know, it's like, I'm calling everyone that I know we need a keyboard player. This is the, the criteria that we're looking for. Um, he's gotta be an amazing piano player because I mean, really filling Roger's shoes was was difficult enough. Um, and, and so we weren't about to get, Roger really did the work of two people but we weren't about to get two people. So, um, so we looked and we listened and we said, no, no, that person, ah, maybe that person, ah, maybe that one, maybe this one. Uh, Jordan Rudis was, uh, was discussed, uh, for a little while, but, uh, he doesn't sing. Jordan doesn't sing. So that was, uh, that was kind of a, uh, that was a sticking point for us. Um, and then, uh, I'll never forget. We were on a bus, uh, in the middle of a Todd tour. And um, uh, and Todd's uh, son, what, what were we on? I don't know if we were on a bus or not. What doesn't make a difference? But Todd's youngest son, Rebob, um, uh, emailed Todd and said, "You know, uh, there's this guy up here in Portland that I know. He might be he he might be someone that you might want to take a look at. Uh, I've heard him play before, and uh, he's he's really good. We heard him play. That was it." called him up. We said, if you want the gig, it's yours. And he learned 21 Utopia songs in 10 days. 
Uh oh, that's amazing. And he'd never heard any of them, had he? No, he was not a Utopia fan. <clears throat> he had no idea who Todd was. Well, um, he, he is now. <laughs> he had just moved here two years before from Israel. And um, and he's just, you know, I mean, he he was the perfect person for the gig. Perfect. Yeah, I think I agree. And, you know, I remember when it was announced that Ralph couldn't do it. I thought, well, that's that's really a drag. But we may be introduced to a new talent we've never heard of before. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was a shame that it happened, but it's great that it worked out the way it did. Yeah, uh, definitely. So, And now he's also playing in your version of Utopia as well, correct? Correct. Um, he is. He, he plays uh, keyboards with me when I do my version of Casim Sultan's Utopia. And uh, 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 in October uh, 1st, we're going out on the road with uh, Todd for uh, Wizard of True Star, the individualist tour, and Gil is uh, is playing keyboards on that. Oh yeah, I got my tickets. So all of a sudden, already. Gil is like the the man in demand. Yeah, you know, he's going to go from knowing no songs to knowing them all. <laughs> at this yeah. rate. and that's yeah. that's awesome because he yeah he's just he's awesome. Yeah, uh, looking forward to that Wizard tour. Um, uh -huh. any uh memories or thoughts to share about that album i know it's predates you a little yeah. bit but you played a lot of that music over the years um you know i uh, all i know about that record i mean besides the fact that i i, I every once in a while we do a bunch of songs from that record is um is, is that it's a very um it's a very dense record it's a it, it it's got a lot of stuff going on in there and um and, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, Todd tried to get as many songs on, on it as possible. I don't know what the what the length of that record is. I think it's around 48. Yeah, well, he usually he was good about squeezing a lot yeah, on one side. Yeah, yeah. You know. the grooves are like you know super super thin. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it, it's just got a lot of stream of consciousness. Um, uh, uh, really, really well-crafted pop songs, some real spacey stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, it was like spark of life is, is kind of kooky. Um, and there's a few other songs on there that are, uh, how about a little fanfare and, um, yeah, this, I mean, that, that, that album runs the gamut from, uh, from the, the, the medley, uh, I'm so proud Ooh baby, baby to, um, to you know just one victory so oh, yeah um, just like the, yeah. the definitive todd anthem in some way exactly yeah i mean we've been doing that song. i've been playing that song for 45 years how many times do you think you played that song at this point well yeah you know i i, I wonder that myself um and if i had to guess i would say it's probably somewhere in the three thousand range maybe oh, wow i thought maybe one but three that's wow yeah well you got to think that you know since 1976 the average number of shows was i mean it averaged out to a hundred shows a year sure. so if that's a hundred shows a year from 76 it's 45 years um and then we didn't play that song every single tour, but we did it most tours. Sure. So I don't know. You say maybe between three. I'm, I want to say between three and four thousand. And am I right? You guys played in the same key. It's always been in. Yes, it's in the. Uh, well, actually, no. On the record, is it? Uh, is it in C? I think it's in C on the record, and we do it in B. In B. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you've been playing it in B almost all along right? since i've been in the band yeah yeah i thought so okay yeah. well yeah that's such a wonderful tone and then that whole record you know i mean side one i i likened it to uh, side two of abbey road on peyote <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one you know, uh, that's, the way it yeah. flows and, and just the, the stream of consciousness kind of yeah vibe of it all so yeah. yeah i'm excited to see that that last tour you guys did a few years ago was awesome too you guys really dug deep it was great to hear stuff like fair warning and yeah the uh, eastern intrigue and some of those uh -huh. tunes from that particular record yeah great. yeah well we'll do we'll be doing that again uh, on this on this one Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I can't wait for that. And when is that that tour coming up? I'm trying to think. October, uh, October 1st is our first show and uh, we open the tour in Boston. Okay, sweet. Well, folks, get your tickets. Um, cause you're, you... well, yeah, well, forget that tour. What about my record? Yeah, well, yeah, hold record. on a minute. Yeah. Let's, let's get back to that and talk yeah. a bit about, um, 
some of the tracks on it. Now, More Love is the single. Yes. And tell us a bit about how that came together and also about the video. <clears throat> well, uh, that particular song was the last song recorded for the record. Um, <clears throat> we, um, Phil and I finished all the songs. We finished the recording. We finished the whole record. And he called me and said, I think it needs one more song. Um, we don't, we have, we have enough up-tempo songs. We have enough ballads. Uh, we have enough mid-tempo songs. We need something that's going to round everything out. Uh, and, and Phil came up with the idea for the track. Uh, and uh, when I first heard the demo of it, I was like, great, let's finish this. Um, and uh, and that's, that was the last song recorded for the record. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the lyric idea kind of fits in with the rest of the record. There's, there's a, little, uh, a little bit of everything on, on this record in terms of, um, you know, there's a little bit of a political statement in one of the songs, whether people know it or not. Um, and, uh, the, you know, there's the ballads, there's the, you know, the, the kind of heart wrenching ballads and there's the, the quirky tunes. Um, but, but, but this, the, for the first single, uh, is just a straight ahead, um, you know, kind of a, a little bit up tempo, um, song that, that has a real positive message and, and is indicative of what the rest of the record is like. Um, and it also has John Siegler on bass yeah. um, and Prairie Prince on drums. Now, is it so, just that track or are they on the whole record? Prairie's on one other song. I, uh, Prairie plays drums on uh, on um, Peace, Love and Understanding. No, okay. does he play drums on that? Uh, no, that's Phil. Phil's playing okay. drums on that. Prairie plays drums on, on one other song. I forget which one it is. And, and, and that's the only song that John Siegler plays on is, is that one. Mitch Prairie, real quick. He's you know he's played with you guys for years. Have you ever subbed with the Tubes? No, um, I, I never did. Uh, we did a tour together in 1986, I think it was. Um, the it, or was it 85? I don't know. Uh, but there was a Tubes Utopia tour, um, and uh, but we I, I never I never joined them on stage. Maybe as a, hey, Kasim Sultan's in the audience, let's bring him up on stage and sing She's a Beauty or, you know, right. whatever. Um, so that's the, you know, but I never, oh. I, I never, quote unquote, joined the band as a, a, as a, as a band member. It'd be kind of neat to see that tour happen again, because that's oh, just I would, like, I would do that. that uh, is I, like, would, I, I love, yeah. I, I love those guys. I love I Fee and Utopia Rick. Utopia and the Tubes is like peanut butter and jelly, you know, I mean yeah it just goes together so well so tell me a bit about some of the other tracks here i'm curious is blame somebody else the political song on here by chance yeah pretty much I mean, uh, with a title like that it made me wonder <laughs> yeah uh you know i mean you you make your own conclusion from it but uh uh you know i i'm not a very um uh, uh politically motivated artist i don't think that uh that for me uh, politics has uh, a place in my uh, in my pantheon of solo material. It's uh, it, 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 I keep my I kind of try to keep my politics to myself. But uh, but there were some things that have gone on in in, in the world over the past um, four to five years that uh, I felt it was necessary to just to kind of. Um, touch on and uh, blame somebody else's well i think that's fair enough because it seems like a lot of people are are great at making messes and then they don't want to own it you know it's like oh somebody else's fault and it's just kind of like oh just cut it you know yeah, well, it's so easy to, you know it's so easy to say hey you know previous administration uh not that wasn't i had nothing to do with that uh and and i think that sometimes um uh, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, assuming responsibility for something that happens during your watch is, uh, you know, it's important. And, uh, it, you, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't, I, I really don't want to get that deep into it other than just uh, that was that that was about as far as I'm going to go in, um, uh, in, in tipping my political hand. I hear you let people just kind of figure it out for themselves. Yeah. yeah. 
So how about God Kick the Stone? That's a rather provocative title. Uh, what's that about? What's that about? Um, you know, it, 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 as I get older, I'm, I, I am a, um, a firm believer in, uh, in, in the universe deciding the future. And, uh, and it, it doesn't necessarily, you can call it God, you can call it Yahweh, Buddha, uh, Muhammad, uh, you know, um, Jesus, what, whatever. There, for me personally, there is a there is a higher power out there. Um, I like to think of it as the universe. Um, and you know, um, so it's it's kind of imagining that there is there is something greater than you that is kind of pulling the strings, and uh, uh, as much as you might want something to be a certain way or wish something to be a certain way ultimately it's really not up to you so um it, so it's ju uh just one more stone is it it, it 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 i think it represents stuff that maybe uh that maybe you uh you the stone represents your your wishes and uh that and and the fact that god kicks it around is just like you can wish whatever you want it's going to be the way it's going to be um whether you like it or not well sometimes i think just putting it out to the universe that you want something mm -hmm. helps sometimes yeah. it comes to you if you just articulate it and it might yeah, seem I have a funny, silly yeah there's a i have a really really funny story of my one of my best friends or my best friend um recently did uh, a, a a lot of wishing about one particular subject and his wish came true um and then we were talking about this and uh he said you know well it, it you know my wish did come true but if it would if it had only had this little attachment to it then it would have been perfect and i said to him you know what the problem is you weren't detailed enough in your wish. <laughs> you, you missed when you asked, you missed that part of it. So you got what you asked for, but you should have asked for a little bit, you know, should have been a little bit more specific in yeah. the ask. But still better than nothing, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so tell us about Fast Car. I imagine this isn't a Tracy Chapman cover. It's uh, no. Well, it's one word. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think Tracy's song is uh, two words. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like we needed an up. We need up tempo songs. We we wanted something fast, and uh, um, and Phil is uh, is he's a he's a rocker mm -hmm. at heart, and so am I for that matter. Um, and uh, and. and uh, we just came up with this idea of uh, uh of you know being stuck uh um actually the song was a co-write with um one of uh, one of phil's other uh songwriting partners uh colin campsey really a wonderful wonderful guy brilliant guy um and they brought the song to me i made a few changes in it and uh and, and that was uh you know what what we try to do on on, on any given record is it, it, it is make up a, you know the the whole pie you know it's like they can't be just crust and they can't be just filling uh it, it, you know it, it it has to have both it needs so, to tick all the boxes yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so that was uh that was an important track to have on uh, on the record and that kind of probably helps to kind of even when you're starting it's like you kind of know the contour of what you want the record to be and you can almost kind of write some songs to fill different moods i guess That's yeah a good way to put it yeah 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 i mean uh you know there's uh, uh there's on one end of the spectrum there's fast car and peace love and understanding which uh, and and blame somebody else which is you know uh, a reminiscent of like a weezer tune um and and then uh on the other end of the spectrum you have to her you know which is just acoustic guitar a string quartet and vocals oh, no. um and, and so you know it's like you were just trying to cover we're trying to make everybody happy really. sure. well it sounds like you've covered all the bases and that yeah. will make for a really well-rounded listen yeah yeah that, that's great um now what was the inspiration for including the cover uh, the nick low tune 
uh, uh, well, I always do covers on on most of my solo records. Um, didn't do it on my first one, but qu from quid pro quo to uh, all sides to three, um, which was my last proper solo record. Um, I I do a cover. I do at least one cover song. I think there's two cover songs on uh, quid pro quo. But uh, but I always like to you know to uh, fill out a record with at least one song that speaks to me um, on a visceral level. And peace, love, and understanding is pretty current, you know, given the, the, the state of things right now in the world. And, uh, and we certainly could use a little bit more peace, love and understanding. Exactly. Well, it's kind of like you're kind of ending and starting with love. As yeah. I thought on this record. That, I, yeah. The, the, the... Not, it wasn't, it, it was not planned that way. It just happened to work out like that. Oh, that's great bookends. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, so I, I wondered about the gear that you use. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine you played bass on most of these tracks. Am I right? Um, no, um, I played bass on maybe maybe half the record. OK. Yeah. So there are a bunch of bass guitars on the record. Um, there is I, I use my um, I don't have one out right now, but I use my my signature bass. Uh, uh, it's called a K bass, a Casim Sultan bass. Uh, it's made by Archer Guitars. Uh, yeah, that's the one we've probably seen you use live in the past yeah. 10 years, five string and four string versions as well, right? Yeah, mostly a four string. Right. Um, so I use that one. Um, I use a, an Ibanez five string that I've been playing a lot, which is a really nice, um, it's a, it's just a really nice, it's just off the shelf. I was in, actually I was in uh, Florida with Todd and um, I, I, I don't know why, I, I just, I needed I needed a bass guitar. I, I, maybe one of mine had broken or something like that, and I just got fed up. And rather than try to have um, the tech fix it, I just said, you know what? I'm going to Guitar Center. I'll be right back. I'm going to go get a bass. And I bought this Ibanez bass off the uh, off the rack, and um, I love it. It's a it's just a really nice bass. The only thing I don't like about it is that it's a five string, and I'm not. I, I'm trying to. I, I had a phone conversation with Victor Wooten. Um, uh, uh, about a month ago and uh was such a lovely lovely guy oh, really is, really yeah. nice guy uh and victor only plays four strings right and so if victor only needs four strings then i only need four strings yeah so the five string is kind of a necessity occasionally when there's certain songs Sometimes maybe like in you know, b or c or something and you want to get those low notes yeah i mean you know for, for the longest time if someone in the beginning of my career if someone had said why don't you play a five string bass i was like what what are you talking about five string there's five string basses right. um so it wasn't it wasn't until the late 80s that five string basses became uh kind of popular sure. and uh and by then um i you know i i was like i don't know it just seemed like like an interesting thing to have yeah but so right. there's my my k bass uh there there there's at least one song with the ibanez on it uh when i'm over when i was over recording with phil um phil has a a, a precision that i use it's probably in somewhere in the late 60s early 70s precision um and I'm trying to think if i used any other bass on this i might have used the rickenbacker on one or two songs oh, that's it. i don't think i've ever seen you play one of those yeah um i i, I just i got one not too long ago and uh I, I've I've always wanted one, uh, I, and I had one. I used one on "Bad Out of Hell" um, okay. for uh, a bunch of songs on "Bad Out of Hell," and, uh, um, and and then for whatever reasons, I I I sold it. I let it go, uh, and I have always threatened myself to buy another one, get another one. I found one uh, in Chicago, actually, that I really like. So I was it new or was it a vintage one? No, it was a vintage. OK, yeah. the new ones don't sound the same to me. You know, those are... I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I haven't like, played a new one. So but, um, oh, that's that's really cool. And it's cool to hear you use Defender also, because I was kind of curious because it used to be like your main bass back yeah. in the 70s. Yeah. The only thing I never liked about the Fender was I'm not a particularly big person and the Fender always kind of dwarfed me. And so I always thought that the bass looked bigger than me. <laughs> um and um you know but uh as i get older and i i care less and less what 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 i look like i shouldn't say that that's not entirely true but uh 
you know, I um, maybe I'll maybe I'll I'll, I'll break the uh, fender out again. Who knows? It'd be kind of neat to see you play that on that next Todd tour. You know, I think that was all Fender on there anyway. Wasn't that Siegler on that album originally? Uh, yeah, there was a couple of bass players on that, but I probably it was probably John for the most part. Yeah, and John's like played that same. What is a it? P bass or jazz? I think it's a P bass or a jazz bass. And it's one. Yeah. No, no, actually. Well, I asked him what bass he used on More Love, and he said it was a jazz bass. Oh, okay. 70, 71, I think a 71 or a 72 jazz bass. Uh, I have a, a DVD of the Utopia Reunion, you know, the show you guys did in New York, where Siegler was playing bass, and then at the end, he, like, gives it to you to play uh, one more victory, one victory, I think. Yeah, yeah so it's kind of cool to see you playing I love John. He's yeah, just he, the best guy in the whole world. Yeah, well, both you guys are just such amazing unique stylists on the instrument and and your styles are really quite different but complementary yeah i um most recently i've been using I, 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 like i use this um the specter that i really like now did you start using specters in the 80s when you're playing with joan jet was that around the time um or? it was actually at the end of uh utopia that i started using specters and what do you like about the specters what made, sets them apart I like the body design. I think the body design is really cool. For me, it works. Oh, it's uh, beautiful it's not a big. It's not a big base. Uh, it tends to be a little smaller, uh, the body. Uh, it's 20, uh, is it 24 frets, I think? Yeah, it's 24 frets. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, it's just a, a, a Stuart makes an amazing instrument. This one I've, I've had since 90, I think 91 or something like that. So I love these guitars. They're, oh, they're it's great. Absolutely. And how about amp wise? What do you what did you use back in the day and what are you using now? Well, I, I, I always used to use a, a, an SVT. Sure. At the beginning of uh, I mean, from the time I was in high school, I had I, I, I had an SVT and uh, um, and then in, in the in the Utopia years, it was SVT. Some that might have been a son uh occasionally here and there but uh it was always an svt with either uh two cabinets or one cabinet and um with the eight by tens then um for a while uh for a, about 20 years i used this small little uh boutique amp company out of princeton new jersey called euphonic audio mm -hmm. and they made some of the best bass amps that uh that are around I, I i i'm assuming they're still in in business they may or may not be i haven't spoken to them in a while now but excuse me most recently um i've been using black star and um black star makes a, a little combo amp with a um with an extension cabinet uh i had the opportunity to uh, to play it on a on a cruise ship uh, we did one of those rock legends cruises and I get to uh, to the uh, to the gig, and they have this SVT with an eight by ten, and we're doing an acoustic show, and I'm like, that ain't gonna work. Sure. It's, that's just overkill. So I said, what else do you have? And they said, well, we just got this little Black Star amp in. It's a one fifteen in a combo cabinet. And uh, I said, can I? Do you mind if I try it? And I just I fell in love with it, and I've been using it ever since. Okay. Very cool. Well, you always have a great tone, no matter what you're playing. Through. Thank you very much. So I have a few random questions that people sent in. Um, sure. My friend Reese wonders, um, by any chance, is that an electro harmonics electric mistress flange on the singering bass solo? It is. Okay. Good ear, Reese. You know your flanges. and uh, Or is that a phase? Um, no, it would have been a flanger, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I did. Did Electro Harmonics make? They must have made a phase box, a phaser. Nope. Yeah, I would, I would think so. But I think that's a flanger. Yeah, I think it's a flanger. Do you use effects very often, or you just no. basically go straight in usually? My my attitude is, you know, uh, between the guitar players with a pedal board uh, and a synthesizer with you know all kinds of swirling stuff going on um it's best if the bass guitar doesn't have any effects on it uh because it just it, it, it to personally um it makes uh it it, it 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 just it muddies the sound up now having said that uh, a good buddy of mine doug wimbish 
has a pedal board that's four feet long uh, <laughs> and every kind of effect that you can imagine on it, he makes it work. Uh, but for me, uh, I, I'm just like, you know, if I do, if I use anything, it's a little chorus pedal, just sure. a little bit of a chorus, just a dash of chorus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How do you feel about P bass versus jazz? I imagine you played them both over the years. Yeah. Um, and I have both, but, uh, uh, you know, um, the only thing that I don't like about the, uh, about the jazz bass is the top of the neck. It's just a little bit too, it's too thin for my hand. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the, where the neck meets the, the nut, um, on a, a jazz bass, it's the rate the, the, thickness uh, uh the, the width of the neck is uh is just a little bit too a little bit too tight for me um yeah. sound wise jazz basses they they sound great and they certainly have a little bit more versatility than a p bass sure but um but i'm a i'm a you know i'm a p i'm a p bass guy it's like if you can't make it sound good with a p bass you got a problem exactly well that's just the classic sound you know yeah and it's you know, it's very direct and meaty, you know, uh -huh. the jazz seems a little more fussy, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, if you get a chance, please ask him about being in Blue, Blue Oyster Cult. Saw yeah. him at the Ohio State Fair in 19 or 1942, no, no 2014. Oh, 2014. Yeah. That was uh, right after I started working with those guys. Um, that, I, I've known uh, the band since 1978. We did a tour together, Utopia and Blue Oyster Cult. It was a co-bill. Uh, and we went from Vancouver to Toronto um, and every single city in between in January. And it was difficult. It was really, really hard. Um, but we became close, uh, or I, I became close with Eric and Buck uh and albert and joe for that matter and alan too um and we've remained close over the years when rudy sarzo uh was in the band for a little while and um he got busy doing other things they needed someone to step in and i got a phone call from donald and he said if you're not doing anything uh would you mind coming and playing a few shows with us and i said absolutely i was home um I had just finished my my work with Meatloaf, and I was just kind of putzing around the house and doing working on my solo material. And I wound up staying in the band for six years. Awesome! So awesome. I, lo I love my time with with BOC. They're great. What are some of your favorite tracks to play with them live? Um, uh, ETI. Oh yeah. Uh, that was one of my favorite, favorite, favorite songs. Um, and of course, I love playing Reaper and uh, and a few others. Um, um, yeah, there, there was a bunch that I enjoyed playing with the band. I got a question for you. Sure. you know, I've loved your vocals, and it seems like they have. You know, time has not touched them. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice for keeping your pipes in shape, and advice you'd give to other people that are of our vintage <laughs> you know uh, i i don't know i mean I, I i certainly don't sing as high as i used to sing uh when i was in my 20s and early 30s um but i can still you know uh I, I, I'm, I'm close i'm close to it um i i you know i don't know now i find that i never i never used to have to warm up but uh now uh warming up is definitely a, a a positive thing to do so i'll always warm up before i sing a solo show if i'm singing backgrounds it's not as it's not as critical it's not as difficult but uh singing uh singing lead vocal for 90 minutes is uh it, it, it can be taxing um sure. and uh what do i do i mean i just drink tea and uh and 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 have some cough drops on stage, and that, that's really about it. Um, uh, luckily, I, I can still sing. I'm 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 blessed that I can still oh, yeah. sing. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, the concerts that you did um, at the drive-in. <laughs> yeah. During COVID, did that remind you of going to the drive-in as a kid at all? 
No, no, <laughs> no, no. total different no. ballgame. Yeah. Um, and and I used to go to drive-ins all the time. Uh, I, I live on Staten Island, and um, there used to be a drive-in movie theater that my dad would take me and my sister to all the time here. Um, but uh, that was one of the first drive-in concerts. I mean, I think they had done one or two in Europe, um, and maybe one or two, maybe one in this country or or two in this country before that one up in uh, New Hampshire, Tupelo Music Hall. Uh, and uh, it was wild. I mean, um, there was about 75 cars in the parking lot and uh, people sitting, uh, you know, outside of their car. And uh, uh, this was at the very, very beginning. It was in May of, of 2020. Um, and, uh, it, you know, being when you're when you're on stage and you're maybe if you're in a big venue and you're like maybe 20, 30 feet from the first row, uh, but there are 10,000 people behind that, you know, it, you, you still feel that energy, that, that excitement, you, you're getting something from it. When you're 20 or 30 feet from the first person and they're sitting in a lawn chair, and then 10 feet away from them is another person and 10 feet away from them is another person. Uh, it's, it, it's a little disconcerting. Um, and, and the, the excitement and energy that you count on, uh, uh from the, uh, from the audience is sometimes a little bit harder to recognize. Um, that's not to say that, it, that those, the people that are there aren't, you know, pouring it out, but, uh, but it's just it's a little more difficult to to get that um, to get that excitement going on stage. And that kind of exchange of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, that was, you know, kind of cutting edge, you know, so kudos for. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that I did that. That was a lot of fun to do. Yeah. That, well, yeah, yeah, that's well, hopefully you won't have to resort to that again, though. <laughs> I hope not. I really do. Yeah. So. Um, just a couple more questions here and then we'll wrap it up. Um, what's your favorite Todd album or a couple of them? Um, uh, uh, my favorite Todd record? Uh, you know, I've never I've never listened to Todd uh, as like I'm going to put a uh, I'm going to put something anything on or I'm going to put Second Wind on, or I'm going to put State on or Global or White Knight or anything like that. My relationship with Todd has always been, here's the songs that we're going to be doing on tour, you know, and they run the gamut from Naz to whatever his last record is or was at that at, at any given point. Um, and I... I, I, you know, I listen to those songs. Um, so I don't know that I have a favorite Todd record. I think that I, I might have a favorite Todd song. Yeah, what's a fa uh, few favorite tracks that you enjoy playing with him? Uh, uh, not long ago, uh, a couple of years back, we did a few uh, tour, not tours, but we did a few shows with uh, orchestras. Um, and one of the songs that we did with an orchestra was, um, if I have to be alone oh. and that is doing, performing that song with a, you know, a, a 55 piece orchestra is just, there's, there's no better feeling than that. It's oh, like, sure. just such a beautiful, beautiful song. And, uh, and he sings the shit out of it. You know, um, he's just, he's an amazing singer and, uh, I always enjoy playing that particular song um some of the other songs that i really like playing are uh, i mean you know I, I love death of rock and roll which is the other end of the spectrum from sure. that or hamburger hell i used to love playing hamburger hell when we were uh when when we used to do that stuff from uh early on in utopia when i first joined the band so there's a there's a bunch of really really good stuff out there you know, yeah. that, that I enjoy playing with Todd. Yeah, I call those the, Todd's bratty rocker tunes. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> He's got quite a few of them. Black and White's another one, I think. Yeah. Um, kind of in that riffy ballpark, I guess. Who were your big inspirations on bass early on? Uh, you know, early on, 
Um, I'd have to say, because even though I'm a huge McCartney fan, it wasn't until the late sixties that I really enjoyed, um, how Paul approached after with Sergeant Pepper and everything after that. Um, but uh, I never really took note of, of McCartney's playing pro probably prior to Sergeant Pepper, even though Revolver and Rubber Soul have some amazing bass parts sure. on it. Um, but John Paul Jones was oh, yeah. one of my biggest and one of my bigger influences. I think that that one of, that my biggest influence on on, uh, on bass guitar was Ron Wood. Oh, that's awesome. With the faces. Yeah. Before not with picked, the face no, i'm sorry I'm, uh, well i mean ronnie wood he certainly played with the faces yeah but it was the record that he did with jeff beck oh okay uh, when yeah. he was in the jeff beck band with rod stewart right and one of the first did, records with jeff beck right the yeah Truth, Beck -Ola, Truth Beck -Ola. Or Beck -Ola, the second one okay yeah yeah one with yeah, the big apple on it the yes magritte yeah. kind of yeah wannabe. that was a magritte uh cover right yeah and which i think paul mccartney has the original Huh, um, must be nice yeah, in his house in <laughs> London. Um, but in any case, um, that was uh, that the stuff that Ronnie Wood did on that record and his sound was just was like really distorted. And um, he's, you know, he's bending notes and uh, he's just playing whatever the hell he wants to play. Um, but it was like it was so perfect. It worked so perfectly. And uh, and I just really I gravitated towards that. Big Chris Squire fan, um, Chris Squire, you know yeah. Chris Squire. Early yes, um, that was a, that was an influence on me. Uh, James Jameson, yeah, sure. um, you know uh, uh, Ron Carter, um, uh, 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 Chuck Rainey. Um, Did you like uh, Jack uh, Bruce much? You know, did I like I liked Cream? I never really, uh, I never really thought that uh that uh, that jack bruce's bass bass playing was something that I, I i wanted to copy um but but those other people that i mentioned i wanted to copy them i wanted to copy john paul jones and led zeppelin too um and, and three uh but uh yeah um i love jack bruce i thought he was great but uh his playing didn't speak to me as much as those other people did I got a silly question. Uh, Entwistle or Stanley Clark? Entwistle. <laughs> that would be my guess, too, or my choice. I mean, yeah. I love Stanley, but that's a different ball game. Yeah. It completely does. It's like, yeah, it's apples and oranges. Like rock versus fusion. Yeah. Did you see Zepp live back in the day? Yes, I did. I saw them at Madison Square Garden uh, at uh, when they uh, did Led Zeppelin three. Oh, awesome. I was 14. That must have been mind blowing. Was that one of your first concerts? Uh, no, uh, actually, one of my first concerts was here on Staten Island. There used to be a, a theater on the south on the north shore of Staten Island called the Ritz. And um, prior to New York City becoming the, the concert Mecca, uh, which I mean, I guess it still was back in the 60s, um, everybody <laughs> would come to Staten Island and play the Ritz Theater before they went to uh, New York. Uh, and with, there was no 90 mile radius clause in contracts. So um, so I would see Yes on Staten Island. I'd see Cactus, um, Vanilla Fudge, uh, the James Gang. Um, uh, I mean, there were so many people I, I, I saw play on Staten Island um when i was when i was a kid that uh yeah that was just um yeah that was great magical times for sure mm -hmm. absolutely yeah well is there anything you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap it up no just uh the only thing i i i hope everybody checks out my new record it, it, it's coming out on on september 17th uh there's a live stream on september 9th uh stay tuned for you can go to my facebook page for info on that and uh it's a really really good record and i hope that people um explore it give it a chance listen to it and uh yeah and just um it, it comes from a from a place of love awesome awesome and again you can get it amazon spotify, iTunes, spotify the usual places and also places. the record label what was that again echo entertainment 
Okay. D-E-C-D-E-K-O, Deco Entertainment. Dot com and you'll be able to pick up uh, a, a, a physical CD there if you still have a CD player or um, the t-shirt you know the all the, the whole merchandise bundle yeah because I get the whole spiel and if there's a a friend on your list get them one as well while you're at it oh, it makes a great Christmas gift yeah Christmas will be here before we know it so it's like stock up on gifts now <laughs> there you go it always helps yeah absolutely well Kaz thank you so much and thanks John, thank you so much for having me I really appreciate it oh being my here. pleasure thank you, thank very, you very, so much for so much. many years of amazing music and inspiration you're very very welcome man right. thank take you take care hope to bump okay. you down the road we'll see bye you. everyone good one bye, bye.